going to be on the associative memories. But of course, before we initiate this topic, uh, I mean whatever we were discussing in the last class, that's to say we were discussing uh, about the learning mechanism and in that uh, we were especially discussing saying, I mean towards the end of the last class we were discussing about the competitive learning, okay, where we have to see one or two more aspects of it so that uh, the concepts uh, go very clearly in our minds. And then we are also going to consider the last aspect of learning which is the Boltzmann because as you remember that we had uh, listed five categories of learning. So we have uh, uh, done four of them and the fifth one that is Boltzmann learning is still uh, the one that we have to do. And after we finish of that we will begin with the topic for the today which is associative memory. So I, I do not know that uh, how much of it I can cover today but at least today I will at least make an introduction to the associative memory and to the extent possible I will go into the depth of it. Okay. So this is going to be the uh, topic of today and let us uh, continue the uh, discussions that we were having uh, in particular about the competitive learning. Now there are uh, a few questions which I think can come to the mind of uh, all of you and that is to say that well and fine we have a network okay let us say I mean certain number of inputs are there and we have got some outputs. In fact the number of outputs that we are going to have for the competitive network is competitive learning network is going to be equal to the number of classes that we would like to have. In fact what type of network is it? Is it a um, uh, supervised or an unsupervised type of learning? What kind of category would you put it into? Supervised, unsupervised? Unsupervised. unsupervised, clearly unsupervised. Why? Because here we are not providing any desired response to it. Okay. We are uh, allowing the network to evolve on its own. So what happens is that I mean we will be having certain number of input units, we will be having some number of output units and the interconnection would be made like this. Okay. So that this uh, input to output will be having their own synaptic weights all right. and then the competitive learning networks as we said that uh, goes through a process of winner takes all in the sense that one of the output units okay, will win the competition and that will actually classify the pattern. Okay. That is to say for a given input pattern one of these outputs would be the winner. So it could be that if you feed a different pattern next time okay, then another network could become the winner. So it all depends that how the interconnection weights between them are adjusted okay. and the learning mechanism that we had seen in the last class okay, clearly said that the delta W k j that is going to be equal to eta times x j minus W k j. So that you had seen that there is a very clear preference for the uh, uh, or Rather to say we should put it this way that the weights that we are going to have is ultimately going to be aligned to the input pattern because I mean for a given uh, output neuron k okay, if it is having connections to many different uh, inputs okay, then the synaptic weights which will be given by W k j that has to get aligned to x j. Now if it gets aligned to that, that means to say what? That means to say that next time you repeat the same pattern, all right. Now the weights are already aligned for that, okay, and there is a greater chance that, or rather, I mean, it's not a matter of chance. It is inevitably going to happen that if it is a winner in the earlier uh, step, okay, then for, uh, I mean, when the pattern is going to be presented for the next time, okay, the same output unit is definitely going to be the winner. In fact, it will be a 
winner in a stronger sense. Why? Because the weights have been already aligned. Okay. Now, let us try to get this concept in a, uh, I mean in the form of some kind of a geometrical interpretation. Let us say that we have got uh, three uh, input neurons. Okay. Supposing we have got input uh, neurons which we are calling as let us say, I mean their inputs are x 1, x 2 and x 3. And let us consider okay, two outputs, let us say that we have the output units to be y 1 and y 2, they are the respective outputs. So, we are going to call all these weights as w 1 1, okay. this one will be w 1 2 and this one will be w 1 3 and likewise for 2 we are going to have it as w 2 1, 2 2 and 2 3. Anyway, so here let us also put some uh, constraint that the, uh, I mean in, in this case this x that is going to be in the form of a vector. So, if we define x as a vector then its elements will be x 1, x 2 and x 3. And supposing we define that the magnitude of this vector is equal to unity. Okay. That means to say what? I mean if we define that this is equal to unity, this means to say that x 1 square plus x 2 square plus x 3 square that is going to be equal to 1. But we can have large combination of patterns realized out of it. I mean given the three inputs x 1, x 2 and x 3 we can realize a large number of patterns. Now, what will be, I mean where will these patterns lie? Okay. What will be the locus of all these patterns? In which space are they going to lie? Sphere. It is going to lie on the surface of a sphere. So, in this case we have got three inputs x 1, x 2 and x 3. Okay. Had there been just 2 x 1 and x 2, it would have been a circle, the locus would have been a circle, but because we have got x 1, x 2 and x 3, the locus is definitely going to be a sphere. So, we can imagine that there is a sphere, okay. the sphere is going to have a center from which the vector will be originating and we will be having for different patterns, we will be having the vectors positioned in different spaces. Okay. Let us say that now we are going to designate the vectors by x 1 vector, x 2 vector, x 3 vector like that. So, I am going to consider x 1 vector, x 2 vector, mind you these are different from x 1, x 2, x 3 because this x 1, x 2, x 3, let me write it down in lower case so as to avoid confusion. These x 1, x 2, x 3 are nothing but scalar quantities which composes the elements of this vector. Okay. But in this case we are going to consider the vectors x 1, x 2, x 3 which will basically indicate the different patterns that we are feeding to a system. And how many such patterns can we feed? There is really speaking no restriction okay. or there is ultimately going to be some restriction that is according to the learning capacity of the network which we are going to study later on. Okay. Right now we do not bother, right now we assume that there could be many different types of patterns that you can feed to the system. So, when you imagine a sphere, okay, maybe that the x 1 vector okay, will have its edge located over here, that means to say from origin to this point on the surface. So, it is actually I mean being drawn as a uh, 3D surface, okay. this is a sphere okay, which is a 3 dimensional surface. So, supposing that this is where we have the x 1 vector, this is where we have the x 2 vector, this is where we have the x 3 vector like that. Okay. Now, we are not going to have just 3 patterns, maybe 4, 5, 6, 7, large number of patterns could be there. So, maybe that here we have got another vector, here we have got another vector, here we have got another vector like that many vectors are there and let us say that here also near around x 2 we are having different patterns, near to x 3 we are having different patterns and let us not say that we have only two output neurons, say that we have got neurons 1, 2 and 3. So, that means to say that this type of a competitive network 
competitive learning network can really classify the patterns into three different classes. Now, from this given example, we can clearly see that there are three distinct clusters of patterns which are existing, is not it? We have got one cluster which is around this where x 1 is lying. We have got another cluster which contains x 2 and also the patterns which are nearing x 2. We have got another cluster of patterns which is close to x 3. Okay. Three distinct patterns are there. So, the behavior that you should logically expect out of this neural network is that one of the neurons out of these three outputs, okay, one of the neurons will be classifying this cluster. That means to say that no matter whether the vector is this one or this one or this one or this one, it will classify according to one. No matter uh, then another neuron, another output neuron will be classifying this cluster and likewise the third neuron will classify this cluster. That is what it is going to do. Now, what exactly do we mean by alignment? So, just like the way we have assumed that the uh, magnitude of this uh, vector is going to be equal to unity, very similarly we can assume that the sum of the weights okay, that is connected to every output neuron okay, that is also going to be equal to unity. Sum of the weights means that uh, squared value of the sum. Okay. So, what I mean to say is summation w k i okay, and this is summed up over i and summation w k i square in fact, we should take. So, supposing we have got n inputs, so that the summation w k i square okay, summed up over i is equal to n that is going to be unity. This means to say what? That supposing that uh, for this pattern x 1 or the cluster that we have shown, supposing we have uh, fed the pattern x 1 vector directly. Okay. So, x 1 is a vector and we, we fed that pattern and supposing that for this y 1 is the winner. All right. So, y 1 is the winner means definitely w 1 1, w 1 2 and w 1 3, these are the weights. Okay. These are the synaptic weights which come into play. So, what will happen is that we are going to have w 1 1 square plus 1 2 square plus 1 3 square equal to unity. And because the output y 1 has now become the winner, this means to say what? It will go by the learning rule. It will definitely go by this learning rule and as a result what happens? That the winner's weights will be adjusted. All the loser's weight remain the same. Okay. But the winner's weight that is to say these ones will get adjusted meaning that this w 1 1, w 1 2 and w 1 3 will now be aligned to the x 1 vector pattern. Is it very clear? That means to say that if earlier we had, I mean let us imagine in the 3 D way that if earlier this was the w vector and what is w vector? w vector is nothing but we are defining it to be the vector consisting of let us say w 1 1, w 1 2, w 1 3. Let us call it as w 1 vector because that is the vector that is associated with the output neuron 1. So, w 1 vector was earlier like this. Supposing this is the position or let me draw it with a different pen that will be better. So, supposing the one which I have marked now, uh, right now that is the position of the initial w 1 or initially w 1 may be somewhere here. But then what are we going to do? We have to steer this vector okay, towards the pattern okay, that has caused the output neuron to be the winner. You understand? We have to, I mean this vector is somewhere here. Supposing this is the vector that we have got over here okay. and supposing the winning pattern is this and the vector lies here. What we have to do is to steer this vector and align it towards the winning pattern. Is this understood? Anybody having any doubt on that? So, that is exactly what we are going to do. So, that means to say what? That initially if we have the vector okay, aligned from the center to this point. Now, 
with the adjustment of the weight the vector will move closer to this. Okay. In fact, if for all these patterns this neuron is going to be the winner then where would you expect the ultimate vector to get aligned ultimately the weight vector to get aligned to the center of the cluster. Okay. No matter in whatever manner we take the center okay. I mean could be the centroid or whatever I mean somewhere in the center of the cluster okay, of the vectors for which it is the winner there the weight should ultimately get aligned to. Okay. This is what is going to happen. So, initially you start with random weights okay. the units 1, 2 and 3 the output units 1, 2 and 3 they will be having all random weights and you will keep on feeding patterns. And now what will happen is that with one pattern becoming a winner for one of the output neurons okay, that output neuron synaptic weights will now get aligned to the winning pattern. Okay. So, like this ultimately there will be three distinct classifications. Okay. If you have more than three clusters okay, then of course, there is a problem and I think you can guess that problem. What is that problem? Because we have got only three output units. So, if we get, uh, get more than three clusters then the output units will not be very sufficient to make the cluster. So, we will be having some error. So, what happens is that if there are four cluster then the fourth cluster elements can get aligned to any of the other clusters and I mean the results will not be very good. So, in fact that is the way whereby we have to decide about the number of output neurons when we have got a very clear cut idea about how many classes that we are going to make. So, this is more or less the geometrical interpretation of the competitive learning network. So, it is indeed going through a process of competition and the ultimate aim is that the weight vector will be aligned to the winning pattern vector that is the clear thing that we are going to do out of the uh, competitive learning network. All right. Sir, yes, the, any question? What is the two clusters have intersection? The two clusters having intersection, well there is a possibility that the two clusters are having some kind of an intersection. So, in that case what happens is that near the intersection region, okay, it can be I mean one of them will be the winner. So, I mean meaning to say that uh, the question that uh, has been asked is that supposing this is one cluster, cluster 1 let us say and supposing we have got another cluster which is cluster 2. Okay. And he has said that uh, the cluster 1 and cluster 2 will be having some kind of an intersection. So, what happens is that this is more or less the kind of an intersection zone. So, what happens is that out of this again okay, uh, I mean ultimately one of these will be belonging to this cluster some neurons uh, some patterns will be belonging to the other cluster. So, that will again depend upon the subtle adjustments of the weights, but ultimately the two clusters are going to merge. So, there could be some little bit discrepancy in the results. Okay. The results are very much ideal, the classification is very much ideal when the clusters are distinct and the number of distinct clusters that we have is equal to the number of output neurons that we have in the system. As long as that is there, the classification is very accurate, otherwise the classification is not that accurate. I mean there could be some sources of error in that. Any other questions that you may be having in your mind? Sigma W K J. Sigma W K J. Yes. Equal to one. Yes. So that was one of the. See, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, this uh, this question is coming. That uh, last class I said sigma W K J is equal to one, and this class I am saying sigma W K J square is equal to one. This square thing I have only said from a geometrical interpretation point of view, so that we can imagine that this is on a sphere. Okay. That is the only reason why I took this to be W k i square is equal to 1. Now, this is one of the, so ultimately the weights are going to have some constraint, whether you define it in the terms of summation equal to 1 or summation square equal to 1, 
the weights are in fact having some kind of constraints between them. It is not that you can keep on increasing the weights indefinitely, there is a limit, you have to keep a check on that. And another uh, thing, yes, I mean I should have told you that, in this case I have taken example of a three dimension. Okay. So, does it mean to say that I cannot take more than three dimension? We can definitely take, we can take four dimension as input, we can take four inputs, we can take five inputs, in which case our input pattern is going to be a five dimensional vector or multi dimensional vector it is going to be, n dimensional vector it is going to be. So, in that case what will be the geometrical interpretation of that, where will the patterns lie on the surface of unit hypersphere. Okay. So, this will lie on the surface of unit hypersphere okay, if we imagine that summation of uh, x i square okay, is equal to 1, okay, that means to say that the magnitude of the input vector is equal to unity okay, and also this is hypersphere because it is more than three dimensions. So, we cannot really conceptualize, we cannot really visualize the existence of this uh, sphere, but it is definitely a hypersphere. All right. So, now let us go over to the next uh, topic that we were going to cover on the learning aspect and that is called as the Boltzmann learning. Boltzmann learning okay. and we are going to cover this shortly. So, now Boltzmann learning is actually a stochastic learning algorithm. Okay. So, I, uh, we have already seen about the stochastic learning aspect, the one which is not deterministic simply that. Okay. So, this is a stochastic learning algorithm and this is in fact derived from statistical mechanics. Okay. Minding you, uh, I mean mind you at this stage I am not uh, going over to any discussion on the statistical mechanics aspects or the details of Boltzmann learning that we will not be doing uh, here. We will only see in a very nutshell okay, about the learning mechanism in it okay. uh, without going into much of details. We will cover the details if we have time towards the end of this course. All right. Now, uh, the neurons okay, basically constitute a recurrent <coughs> structure. Okay and uh, the neurons in a Boltzmann learning, they constitute a recurrent structure and what is meant by recurrent structure? That means to say that there is a feedback, I mean there are feedbacks that exist between neurons. They are all interconnected and they are having feedback. So, neurons constitute a recurrent structure and they operate in the binary mode. So, they operate in binary mode, so meaning that it is excitation could be either plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So, now we can characterize this kind of a machine okay, by an energy function. So, uh, this is recurrent, recurrent meaning that we are going to have self, I mean we are going to have feedbacks, okay, feedback interconnections amongst the neurons. All right. I mean feedback connections between the neurons as also self feedbacks okay, that is also included. Okay. Uh, but of course, I mean in the energy function that we are going to define there the self feedback is not included. So, the energy function that we are going to define for such a kind of a network is given by E which is equal to minus half summation, this is by the definition, summation of W k j x k x j and we sum it up over all the j's and all the k's, but with the condition that j is not equal to k. Okay. All the j's and all the k's with j not equal to k meaning what? That the self feedback is not considered in this case in the energy expression. So, we are not considering any W k k term or W j j term and just simply interpret what it means. You take a neuron labeled as k 
and you take another neuron labeled as J and you have a connection from the neuron J to neuron K and that connection is W K J, K J is from J to K, right? do not make that mistake. So, it is W K J X K X J. So, X K and X J are the inputs and inputs could be either in the level of plus 1 or minus 1 okay? and there will be some W K J, some weight will be associated and we are summing up all these products okay? and together that will be uh, signifying an energy function for this entire network. All right. Now, what it means is that I mean in what sense is it stochastic? Okay, because we said in the beginning itself that it is a stochastic <laughs> learning algorithm. So, it is stochastic in the sense that in this kind of a network. So, imagine that you have got a network like this, okay, maybe some neurons okay, which are interconnected amongst themselves. So, like this the neurons are interconnected amongst themselves and not only that I mean we have drawn this picture where you can say that we can take the outputs from any of these neurons. I mean there are how many 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 neurons that I have drawn. So, it is a 7 neuron system and we can pick up any neuron okay, as output unit or rather to say that any output pattern could be defined as a vector of all these 7 states. Okay, put together. But in a general Boltzmann learning network, we could be having some neurons which do not take part in the output. So, meaning that we could be having a set of neurons which are there in the outer, outer layer and then some set of neurons which are there in the inner layer which serves more like a hidden layer. Hidden layer in the sense that they do not really take part in the output, means we cannot specify, I mean we cannot specify their states in the outputs, but we can take all these neurons okay, for the output. Right? So, uh, basically what happens is that in that case whenever we have got such kind of layerings that some of the neurons are available as output and some of the neurons are not available, they are hidden. In that case, we just segregate the neurons into two categories. The ones that is available at the output, okay, let us say we mark them with a different color. So, all these neurons which I have marked with a different color, those things we are calling as the visible neurons okay, and the ones which are there inside, okay, the ones which are not colored, okay, which are marked as black only, they are hidden neurons. Okay. So, we will be typically having visible neurons as well as hidden neurons. Okay. But what I want to discuss is that or, or say for example, we may be having in this case there is a Boltzmann network where all the neurons in the output layer, they are visible. All the, all the neurons themselves are visible. So, there is no hidden layer in, the, in this Boltzmann network that I have drawn. Okay. Now, what the Boltzmann uh, network is really saying is that when you have an energy like this, this energy is defined for what? This energy is definitely uh, is defined for a particular state of the network and what is meant by the particular state? You take a network like this let us say okay, and supposing you have got some particular state say this is at plus 1 this is at minus 1, this is at minus 1, this is at plus 1, this is at plus 1, this is at minus 1, this is at plus 1, something like this. So, this is a state of the neuron that we can describe. Supposing we begin with this, so plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, this vector, if I form it into a vector, that will define the state of this. So, for this state of the neuron, okay, we will be having some energy function. right? Now, what happens? if I randomly pick up any one of these neurons. Okay. Supposing I just simply decide to pick up this particular neuron, 
supposing I pick up this one and then I after picking up this neuron I change its state, I flip its state from minus 1 I make it to plus 1. Okay. Then what happens? Then we have to recompute this energy is not it because it was computed on an earlier energy I mean uh, I mean based on the earlier state now that I decided to flip it okay, the energy is going to change okay. and what happens that there will be a total change of energy it could be it could increase it could decrease but I can pick up any one and I, I can make it change of the I mean I can cause the change of state. Now, what it means in the stochastic sense is that what is the probability okay, that there will be a change of state for any picked up neuron k. Supposing if I pick up any neuron k, then what is the probability that its state will be flipped. Okay. That probability is stochastic in nature and it is given by this. Okay. So, probability that a neuron k flips its state from its current state x k to minus of x k, this probability is given by 1 by 1 plus exponential to the power minus delta e k by t and what are the meanings of these terms? What is delta e k? Delta e k is nothing but the change of energy, it is the change of energy resulting from such a flip. Meaning by applying this equation, because we decided to flip one particular x k, okay, then what is the change of energy that is there? And what is T as usual is the pseudo temperature. Okay. So, T is the pseudo temperature which we had defined earlier when we talked about the stochastic uh, activation units there we came across this concept. So, what happens that depending upon this delta E k and T, okay, T will definitely signify the noise in the system because basically the concept of the temperature comes about that with increasing temperature the network becomes more noisy, more stochastic, less, less deterministic like that. Okay. So, ultimately what happens is that there will be a condition when the Boltzmann network will have a steady state. Okay. That means to say that ultimately See initially when you allow the network to settle in that case all the vectors will be random I mean there will be some um, uh, random pattern that we are feeding random weights that will be there in the system and now it goes through such change of uh, states and change of states will also happen because every change of state will mean that there will be significant change in energy, significant change, change in delta E k will be there. As a result, there will be more probabilities of change of, uh, uh, so as a result the change of state will happen with more frequent probabilities, but ultimately there will be a state condition when the probabilities of flips will get reduced, which means to say that the network will attain some kind of a stability. We can say that the network has uh, attained the thermal stability. But one thing that one can tell about the uh, Boltzmann uh, uh, network is that firstly that we have already classified the Boltzmann neurons into two classes. So, Boltzmann neurons we have already classified to be the visible one that is available for the outside and hidden. Now, one thing that we have to understand that uh, can we change the states of all the visible neurons as per our will or can we allow 
all the neurons which is available at the output layer or which is available in the visible way, can we afford to change everything? Perhaps we can, perhaps we cannot. In which case we cannot? If we happen to put some constraint on the system, because ultimately this kind of a neural network, Boltzmann network, you are going to use in some application. Now, that application may put forward some constraint okay, that this, 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 this neurons, I do not want change of state to be there. Maybe that if you have 100 neurons visible, you can decide that out of that, I will not be allowing change of states for these 15 neurons, these are my constraints. I am clamping it that some of these will be permanently as plus 1, you can never change its state some of these will be permanently in minus 1, you can never change its state. Like that we clamp the states of those neurons. Maybe out of 100 I specify that 15 are so clamped and the remaining 85 are free. Free parameter adjustments are possible with remaining 85. And when it comes to the hidden, then there is no question of my specifying constraint, because the hidden neurons do not take part in the output. Right? So, the hidden neurons should always be free. So, there is another classification that we are doing that is the visible network, the visible neurons we are classifying into two groups. One is the neurons, the visible neurons which are clamped, clamped in the sense that their states are predecided. So, this is dependent on the environment. So, dependent on the environment. So, depending on the environment, we are going to decide that some of the neurons will be clamped and there will be some other neurons which will be free and hidden neurons, okay, they will be always free. Okay. Now, that means to say that when we have some free neurons and free uh, and some clamped neurons, okay, then how does the system learn? That is what we are going to study, right? So, the learning could be defined like this that we consider that uh, let us let us say that we denote rho k j plus to be the correlation correlation between neuron k neuron k and neuron j in the clamped condition. Any suggestion how can I mathematically define a correlation in this case? Any simple mathematical way that you can suggest? Two neurons, one is neuron k, another is neuron j. So, we are going to define a correlation for that. So, what is going to be a simplest form of correlation? When you are going to say that uh, neuron k and neuron j are correlated, when their states are same, that is right. So, if both of them are plus 1, it is correlated. If both of them are minus 1, then also it is correlated. But if one is plus 1, another is minus 1, it is uncorrelated. So, what is the measure of correlation? You simply multiply their states. Okay. So, if the multiplication gives you a value of plus 1, then it is correlated. If the multiplication gives you minus 1, it is uncorrelated. So, we can consider that this rho k j s also are binary quantities plus 1 or minus 1, plus 1 for correlated case and minus 1 for uncorrelated. So, we are saying that rho k j is the correlation for the neuron k and neuron j in the clamped condition, mind you. Okay. And uh, we have, we again define another uh, correlation parameter which we are defining as rho k j minus, okay, which is the correlation between the same neurons okay, in the free running condition. Okay. In that case, delta w k j will be defined by again whatever we do for learning this fellow is unavoidable the learning parameter it will be always there okay this eta 
the learning rate times rho k j plus minus rho k j minus and again this will be defined for j not equal to k and this is our Boltzmann learning rule. So, it is definitely a stochastic learning rule that we have decided. Okay. So, uh, based on this factor the w k j the weight adjustment will be there, okay. but more than that I am not uh, discussing about the Boltzmann network at this stage, because Boltzmann network really needs some more detailed explanation which we will see later on. All right. So, now we can uh, afford to begin the topic that we promised for today that is about associative memory. In fact, in the remaining time the only thing I, that I can do is to give you the concepts about the associative memory. Now, just note the two words in it. I said associative and I said memory. Okay. Now, how are these two things really related? In fact, if you see the learning mechanism, okay, how do we learn? I mean forget about artificial neural networks. Let us come to our case. Okay. How do we human beings learn? Okay. We learn a lot using association. Okay. We can always relate. I mean based on our experience we can relate that this is something that I had seen there. Okay. Supposing in front of me I have got students from IIT okay, who are attending this course. Okay. Now there are large number of students. I may not be able to uh, recollect the names of every students. Okay there are 80 or 70, 80 students in this group. So, then what happens that supposing I see one of the persons in the market. Okay. Now, what I am going to do? I am not, I am certainly not going to uh, recall the name of that person because I mean I, I may not be knowing the name. I mean unless he is a very familiar person, I mean a student whom I have observed for uh, I mean one year or two years or he has attended, he or she attended my earlier course. So, I may be able to re recollect the name immediately, but then what I am going to do is that I, I will think that yes, it is a very familiar face and where have I seen this uh, person. Okay. So, then I recollect that yes, I have seen him in the class, he is the person who is attending the neural network course. Okay. So, there is a kind of an association that I am making that okay, for the neural network course I have got an association that okay, whenever that face is presented to me as a pattern. So, what is that face? That face acts as a as an input pattern to me and then I put him into the category that okay, I have seen him in the neural network class. Okay. So, there is a kind of pattern association that we are doing. So, it is actually whenever we are associating anything, we are recalling from our memory and then only we are associating. Okay. Now, what is the concept of a traditional memory? Because memory all of us understand because nowadays I mean everybody is using computers okay, and we know that computer has got large amount of memory. Okay. We have got uh, memory in the form of RAM, we have got secondary memory in the form of hard disks and what not. So, then uh, what is the difference between this memory and that memory? Now, there we feed the address of the memory, there every memory, the memories are actually arranged in continuous locations and every memory location will be having some address. So, I will be giving the address of that memory and then I will be retrieving the data corresponding to that address. Okay and I will use that. Okay. That is what we are doing for all our computational purpose. Now, here what I am doing is that I am not feeding the address. I do not really know that I mean if my 
uh, brain has got a large amount of storage space, I am not really remembering or it is not possible for me to specify that where in the memory, which address location in my memory did I store this person's face. It is not possible uh, for me to know. I see the face, that face acts as a pattern, that face acts as a stimulant and based on that stimulant I go over to the memory and then get it. So, here it is something like the retrieval that I am doing from the memory is based on content. The pattern is a content, I am accessing that and then I am able to retrieve the data out of that. Okay. So, really speaking we are feeding the content and then we are getting the uh, response from that memory okay, that yes, this content I have seen him in neural network course, this content okay, I have seen him in the department office, this is the pattern content, okay, I have uh, I mean he, he is a shopkeeper somewhere, okay, I have seen him. So, this is the kind of a, an association that we are making. So, it is a memory that involves very much the association and I think from all this discussion you can very easily understand that it is in fact I mean the process of association and the process of memorizing they are very much interrelated to each other. The process of learning and the process of memorizing they are very much inter, interlinked to each other. Now, let us see that what kind of memories do we have especially the memory of our brain. Okay. Now, it is seen that the memory that we use okay, can be divided into two broad classes. One is a short term memory okay, and the other is the long term memory. So, if I ask anybody in the class over here that what was the menu for today's lunch, okay? you are definitely going to tell me, is not it, that okay, the menu was this, that we had uh, rice, we had dal, we had chapati, we had uh, uh, some uh, sabji curry, something. Okay? So, you will be able to tell me from your short term memory. Now, if I ask you the question that what was the menu for you on Monday, will you be able to give me the answer? Simply say that no, we do not remember what was the menu for Monday lunch or what was the menu for Tuesday lunch. I mean three, three four days back whatever menu was there, even yesterday's menu we will not be able to tell. Okay. So, why cannot we tell? Because it is in the short term memory. But if I ask you that in which year did you appear for your uh, high school leaving examination, are you going to make a mistake on that? Never. Okay. If you have passed out your schooling in the year 2000, you are going to say that yes, it is year 2000. Even if I ask you 15 years from now that in which year did you uh, have your school leaving examination? you are going to say that it was in the year 2000. Okay. You are never going to forget that. In which year you got into IIT, you are never going to forget that. That means to say that this is something that goes into your long term memory. So, we have got these two categories, the short term and the long term. Okay. Now, one thing that why is the short term really a short term? Okay. Let us also uh, I mean try to understand that, because the short term memory is all the time indicating some current information, the very latest and current information okay, which is going to be updated and corrected all the time. Now, why cannot you remember the menu okay, of your lunch? Okay? I mean, you can remember only the menu of today, I mean which you have taken just a few hours back you took your lunch. So, you can uh, remember the menu, but why cannot you remember for one or two days back? Because it is getting updated all the time with the current information. So, it is not possible for you to I mean retain all these things into your long term memory and there is no point. In fact, I mean 
there is a kind of intention also that goes on. I mean, I do not think that anybody will deliberately try to remember the lunch menu and that too when it is hostel lunch. Okay. Anyway, so let us uh, see the uh, aspects of associative memory. So, all that we can uh, cover at this stage is some characteristics of the associative memory. Okay. So, we list out some characteristics. The first characteristic is that the memory is distributed. Okay. And what is meant by distributed? Very simply that it does not lie in one particular location, means all the memory locations okay, are not lying in one particular place. They are distributed, even in our brain. Okay, the neurons are distributed all over the brain okay. and this is highly distributed in nature. In fact, what happens is that together we are feeding some input activity pattern. So, there is some input activity pattern that we are feeding as a stimulus to the system okay. and then the system or our brain or whatever you say or artificial neuron, uh, neural pattern whatever you think of. So, it gives some output activity pattern. So, there is a mapping that takes place from the input activity pattern to the output activity pattern okay. and this happens in a distributed memory environment. Okay. We will come to that, I mean we will come to the details of that uh, soon okay. and then the second characteristic that we can say is that the stimulus pattern, what is meant by stimulus pattern? The input okay, like little while back the example that I was giving you, the stimulus pattern is the face of the person whom I am seeing right now and I am trying to associate. So, stimulus pattern that is one pattern and then we are also going to have a response pattern. Okay. Now, what is the response pattern? Again, it is not only that I know that uh, I have seen this person in neural network class, but also more or less I will be able to I mean predict some more things. Okay. Maybe that normally this particular person sits on the left hand side of the class okay. or normally this is the person who sits on the front bench. Normally, this is the person who will sit somewhere in the middle row. Okay. Normally, he prefers to uh, sit on the extreme right hand corner of the class like that. So, there is a response pattern that also we get that once a stimulus is presented, okay, we are also going to get a response pattern. Okay. Then the information contained in the pattern, uh, information, so stimulus pattern and response pattern they are in the form of data vectors. Now, this is quite obvious. Why is the stimulus pattern a vector? Because stimulus pattern is in this example for a, uh, I mean let us take that example, the face image. Okay. It is a stimulus. So, what is that? It contains a data. I mean it is, it, it, it contains a pixel data okay, that every, I mean at every picture element we are having some uh, intensity, some color and all that. Okay. So, that is a data vector at the input and response vector again that is also a data, it is giving that in which particular location this person sits and all that. Okay. Then the information not only contains the storage location, but also its address for retrieval. So, information contained in the stimulus okay, also determines 
its address for retrieval. And then another very important aspect is that it is, it has got high degree of resistance to noise. What does it mean? This means to say that, uh, I mean although uh, the neurons, the neurons are doing the ultimate processing, is not it? The neurons could be operating under noisy conditions, I mean we, we could be operating the neurons in a stochastic way, but even then okay, our associative memory works in a mode that it has got very high degree of resistance to noise. So, although the neurons themselves will be noisy, but still the classification that we are making, the association that we are making, it is highly resistant to noise. Okay. And then the last point that we would like to mention about the characteristic is that there is a high degree of interactions between the patterns, okay. high degree of interactions okay. and that often leads to errors during recall process. Now, I give a simple example to that. Okay. I think it happens, uh, I mean many times in our real life. Okay. Now, I mean uh, somebody had once asked me that, hey, I think uh, you are working in syndicate bank Bombay branch, is not it? I have seen you over there. Now, I am surprised that no, I am certainly not in, not, a, uh, not an officer uh, or employee in syndicate bank and that too posted in Bombay. Okay. I am a simple person living in IIT Kharagpur. Okay. I am just teaching over there, I am not a bank officer. They said, no, I th think I have uh, seen you. So, what happens is that maybe that my face okay, looks very similar to somebody who is working in syndicate bank Bombay branch. Okay. So, they say that I, I mean somebody recollects wrongly. So, what happens is that there is a very similarity in the pattern. Maybe that I mean because my face resembles another person, okay, people make a wrong conclusion, it is quite possible. So, there are interactions between the patterns okay, and also another thing which is going to happen that there is a definite learning capacity up to which we can learn and if we try to go beyond that, okay, there could be errors in the recall process. In fact, we are going to see all these things in terms of artificial neural network behaviors okay, in the next class. So, this is just only an introduction to the associative memory. Thank you.